I welcome very much Eva Schwarz, Gianni Plate Blumborg and uh, Maria Bröckel. All of them um, work in Stockholm in Sweden at the um, Center for Studies in Practical Knowledge. And um, Eva Schwarz, she's a philosopher and associate professor in the Center for Studies in Practical Knowledge. Her research fields are philosophy of education, subject theory, ethics, and philosophy of science and knowledge. And um, at the moment, she's enrolled in the research project Collective Phronesis. Um, her last um, publication has the title To Act as One Body, Collective and Embodied Judgment Within Professional Action and Education, from 21. Uh, Jenny Platte Blomberg is a doctoral student um, in the theory of practical knowledge, and she's writing a thesis on Swedish and Finnish teachers' lived experiences of boredom. And uh, Maria Bröckel, she's a senior lecturer at the Center for Studies in Practical Knowledge and works at the teacher's program, especially in the uh, preschool teacher program. So, thank you very much for being here, please. Yes. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I'm Eva Schwarz of the three of us, and thank you for staying. Uh, even if we speak about such uplifting topics such as boredom, disembodiment, and isolation. I hope you won't be bored. That was not my joke, but... I'm. And uh, I will introduce our panel shortly, and then I will hand over to Maria Bröckli and then to Jenny, and then I will give my talk. And we will speak in a row, the three of us, and we will have time for discussion afterwards, the three of us, so you can address us afterwards individually, yes? And I thought we could say a bit about the studies in practical knowledge. It's a quite new interdisciplinary field. I think there are two places in the world, like in Stockholm and then also in Bude. Kore will give his talk tomorrow, it's in northern Norway. And we celebrated our 30th birthday last year. And it's an interdisciplinary field and we're working on the interplay of different forms of knowledge in welfare professions, mostly interpersonal professions. So it could be police, nurses, psychiatrists, and there's also a group of us working on the profession of teachers. And yes, we interpret practical knowledge as a way of relating to other people in a skillful way. And this includes also sometimes more tasted dimensions, such as attunement or embodiment, or just the way you look at someone or how you use your voice when you approach someone. But skillfulness here is not only taken to be the fulfillment of external tasks. It's also um, related to the question of how, for example, a practice can be realized as a pedagogical practices, or which political or institutional presuppositions those who are involved in these practices need in order to act skillfully, or how the criteria for skillfulness are formulated. I'm not quite sure for the term skillfulness, because it's very much related to craftsmanship, if I understand it, but if you know Swedish, it's about schicklighet or geschicklichkeit, maybe. But I'm unsure, it's also more, it sounds like you, you know this game Mikado. Yes, uh, and we, about the theoretical background, as um, Malta said, we are interested in the concept of phronesis and very much influenced by the Aristotelian uh, tradition, but many of us are working within the field of phenomenology and existential philosophy. And it's also, that's partly because of the topics we're interested in, but also because of, we think that the phenomenological method is very interesting in just revealing this more taken for granted or hidden structures of practices. And the topics we choose there may be one of those structures that often are more in the background of our practice, like the social, the, the body, or the, our engagement. But we take the topic of this conference and this question of the crisis of the pandemic as a situation where 
we discovered um, how uh, negative phenomena as disembodiment, experiences of disengagement and disconnectedness. And we take it that this negative phenomena says something about pedagogical practice as such, as not only in the situation of the pandemic, but reveal something that seems to be on stake in general when we're doing, when we're involved in teaching and learning. And so we want to lift some sort of the vulnerability, difficult word, the vulnerability of pedagogical practice, but also uh, the exposed role of the teachers in this situation of the pandemic as we will shortly speak about. So, um, yes, the first one out is Maria Pröckl on disembodiment. Hello. <laughs> In this presentation, I let my thesis meet my experience of online teaching with teacher students during the pandemic in order to discuss why I experienced a sense of disembodiment during that period. My thesis is about preschool teachers embodied and practical knowledge. The research questions were founded in an interest in embodiedness and embodied knowledge that is rooted in my former career as a dancer and a dance teacher. And they aimed to reveal how preschool teachers' knowledge is expressed in preschool everyday life. My empirical material consists of participant observations in preschool where I watched, took notes and filmed. Some of the films I shared with the preschool teacher I had filmed. And we discussed the content. Are you changing something? Thank you. <laughs> Finally, I interviewed the preschool teachers I had visited. In a later additional part of the inquiry, I did a series of talks or conversations more like, uh, where I, during a year, continuously met with a number of preschool teachers. The forms of embodied knowledge possessed by the preschool teachers in this study appear as relational and situated in the co-embodied sphere shared by the preschool teacher and the child, or more correctly, by everyone in the group. These knowledge forms are linked, for instance, to responsibility, empathy and sympathy, and to the acknowledgement of one's own vulnerability as well as the others. And I have chosen to describe them using terms such as weight, groove, and empathetic timing. My informants place their knowledge in a relational context. And with support from Merleau-Ponty, Merleau I would like to stress that it is a pre-linguistic co-embodiedness that shelter the relations. In this co-embodied sphere, the preschool teacher reassures the child and shows it was what is, uh, an, what is ex expected of her or him and invite the child to a we. The pictures you see, the picture you see, uh, could be understood as this we. It's from the cover of my thesis and is painted by Pia Lindenbaum. As I already mentioned, I have a history in the practices of dance, and throughout the research process, I have made analogies to dance from what I have experienced in my fieldwork and interviews, but also in the writing of the thesis. An analogy is a similarity, something that could be understood as equivalent. Thinking analogically is described by the Norwegian philosopher Kjell S. Johannesen, as using different perspectives as objects of comparison and thereby angle the situation one is in so that another possibility of for action opens up. Unlike reflection, which is tied to concepts and therefore translated into language. Analogical thinking 
comes out of experience-based knowledge. And by letting analogies guide me, I saw similarities that led me to try some, some dance concepts with my informants. And in that interplay, the concepts that came to denote different aspects of embodied knowledge grew. I think that this knowledge is uh, um, some kind of um, practical knowledge. And amongst the concepts of knowledge we develop, there are some that, that leads to the actions, to action that limits as framing and weight. I found that the preschool teachers hold and frame the room, for example, at meals or in pedagogical settings as the morning get together to reassure and to hold and to show uh, a way of acting like here we listen to each other, here we eat the food, we wait for our turn, join in the conversation. Then there are concepts that lead to the act of opening up of daring to show trust and be competent, such as groove. Groove can occur in relaxed settings, and I see it as a play and trustful way to act. The bridge between these different action options is empathetic timing, and my informants underline that both the holding and the opening approach are needed by the preschool teacher. If he or she cannot open up, the firmness in framing become too severe and static. But if, on the other hand, there is no framing at all, the openness in groove becomes unreliable and unsafe. It is a balancing act that requires judgment and constant reflexive deliberation in order for everyday life to run steady. I do not understand the concepts presented as abilities that are fixed, that are forever and that the preschool teachers once acquired can count on. It is knowledge, yes, but it is knowledge that is in motion because the situations in which they are needed are in motion. I see them as a form of practical knowledge. Within the theory of practical knowledge, we tend to stress the following. Practical knowledge is often hung up on habits. We do what we do because it usually turns out well. But when the situation for one reason or another takes a different path than usual, we need to reach for an alternative way of acting. And this is when we need phronesis. This is when, when the act of phronesis shows itself. The experience-based form of practical knowledge where acting itself is to be understood as knowledge. Aristotle says that phronesis is not forgotten, and I agree, but I would like to make one reservation. Phronesis may not be forgotten, but can be lost if we fail to keep our intention to act according to the best within us, as Aristotle puts it. In this neoliberal time that we're stuck in, something that Jenny will address further in her talk, we can feel emptiness and suffer from fatigue, which in the long run affects our ability to inter interact with them who depends on us. In a meaningless setting, we can be worn down so that we are unable to listen empathetically. Teachers' ability to act with practical knowledge can be lost if they experience boredom and emptiness and no longer can see the meaning of their work. Values that the preschool teachers say are of the utmost important importance for the children are then at stake. I would say that my own approach to students is constituted in a similar way as the preschool teacher's relationship to the children, with one major difference. I don't have the deepened relationship that a preschool teacher and a child have who spend many hours a day together, sometimes for years. Usually for me, it's more like meetings. But still, during a successful seminar, I use weight, groove, and empathetic timing. I hold the room. 
to ensure that all students dare to speak and think freely and that they know what is expected of them. I share the floor and I try to see all of them. I also try to open up to the students, invite them to a we. For me, the successful seminar is an embodied activity. I balance on the bridge of empathetic timing so that I don't let go too much and don't hold too firmly. Of course, I don't always succeed, but I strive towards it. And what do I have to work with in the seminar when I, when I don't have a proper relationship to my students? We share the room. I feel their breaths, mine. I see the nods, the misty look of disinterest or boredom, the commitment of understanding, and when someone gets jumpy, perhaps out of irritation or frustration, or when something fits in, perhaps an analogy, and creates clarity or more questions. Those are the outward signs. But there is more that I can't put my finger on. But it still affects me. I perceive it before the words before awareness, in the co-embodied sphere, it affects me, the turns my mind take when I am amongst the students. I feel that I can perceive the gap they experience when they don't get it. And I feel when they are on the way to understand. Interesting enough, I had the same experience as a dance teacher as I have now as an academic. I also get hold of my own knowledge through my body as a dancer as well as an academic. I stand firmly on the floor, slightly bent knees, want to feel contact with the surface. I want to ground myself bodily so that my thoughts can move and that I can be attentive. I teach courses that are close to my research field, things that engage me, close to the body and the embodied. Uh, during the pandemic, when teaching online, it sometimes felt like I was teaching a collection of stamps. 30 stamps with pasted faces in the center, flower pots in the background, or pillows, like in a sofa. Some students nodded a little, some looked bored, and some didn't move at all. I wanted the stamp collection in front of me to move. I wanted to move myself. Of course, I, I made a lot of attempts to adapt my seminars to the current situation and create meaningful exchanges, group conversations, reading logs, shared chat room, Zoom coffee, etc., etc. But it was, as a whole, a disembodied experience. American philosopher Drew Leder states that the body is placed in the background of our consciousness when we engage in the world. This is, so to speak, the normal way to experience the body. When we become aware of our body, it's often in a kind of disappearing form, he writes, in the absent body. As sick, or as vulnerable, or as incapable in any way. When that happens, we can be thrown into a clear awareness of our own body. I really can't say that the body disappeared when I felt frustrated at the seminars during the pandemic in this Lederich way, but it wasn't in the background either. It was just gone. And I suddenly did not understand the situation. No breathing guided, no hints of what questions that might come. I felt that the pre-linguistic understanding was put out of play. And thus, there was only room for reflections or thoughts that we attached to concepts. Without the embodied or co-embodied sphere, the, the analogical thinking could not emerge. And the approach in the reflections did not come from what we jointly built, it felt like. We were isolated, solitaires, each one with a stamp collection in front of us. The tactile room was our own, 
not shared, and somehow this disembodied us, both to ourselves and to each other. Without the shared and co-embodied sphere, everything becomes so much more complicated because meaningful impressions are lost. An example of this is when preschools in Sweden, which were open during the whole pandemic, had to introduce toddlers in new ways. Not as usual with parent active introduction, where the parents somehow are introduced to preschool along with their children. No parents were allowed on the preschool premises. The introduction took place outdoors. Preschool teachers talk now talk about introductions that took forever with very sad children for a very long time. They could not comfort the children without their normal routines of being close. The bodies should be kept apart, not seek each other. The parents did not get a chance to show their child that preschool is a good place by joining in and doing preschool for a couple of days or a week. They also didn't form their own picture of everyday life. They just had it retold from the preschool teachers thus unable to really understand their own child. According to Merleau-Ponty, the body is something that we are and something we have. It is experienced and experiencing. Through the body, we reach out to others and we interact through our embodiedness. We affect and are affected in many ways through the body. We are and we carry our experience in the same body. The interaction with others also shapes and influences how I understand the world, how I understand my ability to act in the world, and how I understand myself. My reason for emphasizing the co-embodied sphere is because I understand it as the starting point of every relationship between a preschool teacher and a child. I would like to say that it's a central resource for the preschool teacher. In this sphere that holds the core of the relationship with the children, well, and based on this, I would like to point out that the co-embodied sphere is important in all relationships. But the fact that children and preschool teachers have to be able to start a relationship and understand each other before the child has learned to speak shows the, the special importance of the co-embodied in preschool. However, in order to do my best as a teacher, I depend on the same thing. And I think that values are at risk if online teaching does, does not start with an awareness that the body needs to be present and engaged to the greatest extent possible when we are teaching or trying to learn something. Transferring an educational idea, the seminar, to virtual was a necessity during the pandemic, but I cannot see the long-term sustainability of that solution. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Jenny Plotte Blomberg and I'm a doctoral student. I'm also an upper secondary school teacher and I teach uh, students in philosophy and Swedish and have been doing that for 50 years. In my forthcoming dissertation, and I have three more years to go, I investigate teachers' lived experience of boredom, of which digitization is one aspect. In the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, Martin Heidegger elaborates on boredom and presents three forms, bored by, bored with, and profound boredom. Starting from his forms, I will in this presentation explore a fourth, boredom fatigue, and how it appears in my digitized everyday practice as a teacher. Since I haven't done my field work yet, this presentation is based on my own experience and spontaneous discussions with my colleagues. 
To Heidegger, boredom per se is like anxiety, a fundamental attunement or mood. And as such, it is a potentially enlightening experience. It has the ability to open us and to throw us back to ourselves, to our proper self. Even though he gives a comprehensive description of the three forms, he also emphasized that it is a matter of learning and understanding how to move in the depths of Dasein. Dasein is the concept he uses to explain the relationship between the subject and the world, a way of being engaged in the world. From the standpoint of my area of interest, I would like to claim that, if I may paraphrase Heidegger, studying boredom is a matter of learning and understanding how to move in the depths of my everyday practice as a teacher. Boredom can open and unfold, for instance, the ethical and didactical choices I make, my ideas of what a good teacher is and in what way I'm affected by cultural norms. The questions I intend to explore in this presentation are how does boredom fatigue as a result of digitization appear in my everyday practice as a teacher? And how did I experience boredom fatigue during COVID-19 when upper secondary schools in Sweden were closed and teaching took place via digital devices? So let me start by explaining Heidegger's three forms of boredom. What they have in common is that they hold us in limbo and leave us empty, which in turn stands in relation to time, time as temporality. What sets the forms apart is that they anchor differently in Dasein. While bored by is the most superficial form, profound boredom is more anonymous and lurking. He starts by explaining the superficial form bored by and gives an example of an everyday situation. We are waiting at a railway station. It is four hours until the next train arrives. We are bored and try to occupy our, ourselves with all kinds of things, repeatedly looking at the watch to see how much time that has passed. But our occupations are doomed to fail, since the specific thing, person or situation that bores us is holding us fast. Boredom is realized in the present moment. We are held in limbo where time drags between arrival and departure. And we are being left empty when the things we occupy ourselves with do not in this particular situation meet our expectations. We are abandoned to ourselves, not able to drive boredom away and experience a loss of time. And according to Heidegger, by killing time, we don't need to listen to boredom. In the second form, we are bored with. Here, the passing of time is more diffuse. Once more, Heidegger describes an ordinary situation. We've been invited to a party and we are having a good time. And yet, later that evening, back at home, we realize I was bored with the evening, but why? What distinguishes the second form is that we become aware of boredom afterwards through reflection, but cannot pinpoint what was boring to us. When we are bored with, the passing of time is hard to detect, as it is interwoven with the things we get involved with. We are held in limbo, where time stands still. We are in the midst of the present time, there is no past and no future. And in this situation, we don't want to listen to boredom. But it is just an illusion, Heidegger says, and a waste of time. We are being left empty because we abandon ourselves, our proper self in the situation. We are boring ourselves. The third form is the most profound one. And as such, Heidegger cannot find an example to present us with because it is not relative to a particular situation, person or thing. 
It is boring for one, boring in general. Profound boredom appears when we least expect it, encountered in a questioning attitude. We are held in limbo where one feels timeless, removed from the flow of time, and boredom cannot be held back by any killing of time. It is overpowering, a telling refusal of everyday life and its possibilities. Time has no meaning. We are being left empty, but it is an emptiness as a whole, and we are compelled to listen to boredom and what it has to give us to understand. We are being thrown back to ourselves and the not yet exploded possibilities. So, how is Heidegger's three forms related to boredom fatigue and my everyday practice as a teacher? When I began to study boredom, it was in the midst of COVID-19, the epidemic. I was writing my master's in the theory of practical knowledge, and my original plan was to write about desire. In the Swedish Education Act, there is a sentence that I find very interesting. It says, education should promote a lifelong desire to learn. And I wanted to explore what, they, what it means for a teacher to promote a desire and a lifelong desire. But then in March 2020, from one day to another, universities and upper secondary schools were asked to transition to distance learning. Even though we didn't have a total societal lockdown, we were uh, recommended to stay at home. So I stayed at home teaching, as uh, Maria put it, a collection of stamps, feeling uninspired and unable to produce any written pages on how to promote a lifelong desire to learn. I was bored and began to explore that mood instead. When I read Heidegger's Exposé on Boredom, and a text by the literary scholar Eran Dorfman, who has a different take on boredom fatigue than I am, uh, and then reflected on my day-to-day -day practice, I realized that my boredom wasn't just caused by the extreme situation I was in. It had to do with cultural historical structures. It had to do, as I see it, with the changes that the Swedish school system in general an upper secondary school in particular has gone through sin since the 90s due to a combination of neoliberalism, the implementation of new public management and digitization. This, I believe, forms the backdrop to boredom fatigue among teachers. So during the 90s, the Swedish school system underwent major reforms. For instance, it went from being state-controlled to municipally controlled. Today it is governed by the market when private owners are allowed to start independent schools with support of tax funds. In parallel with this, state-funded investments and requirements for digitizing the upper secondary school were launched. And in the 2010s, the goal was, quote unquote, one to one, one teacher, one computer, one pupil, one computer. With the implementation of new public management and the digitization, the requirements for equival equivalence and quality have increased. Schools are made comparable and measurable through more mandatory national subject tests. In 2011, the upper secondary education received a new curriculum with more detailed course plans and demanding knowledge requirements for which the teachers are provided a matrice to fill in. The requirements for documentation increases, maybe you recognize this, on a structural level where teachers shall on an ongoing basis give each pupil information about the study results and development needs in the studies. But it is also increases on a personal level. We are inclined to document a bit more, just in case a pupil, a parent, or principal takes the liberty to question the teacher's professional knowledge. 
and judgment. And then there was the issue of boredom fatigue. So the cause to boredom fatigue is, as I see it, to be found in the mentioned backdrop. Drawing on Heidegger's ideas that boredom stands in relation to time as temporality, that it holds us in limbo and leaves us empty, I now turn my gaze on boredom fatigue. When we suffer from boredom fatigue, we are not held in limbo where time drags or stands still, or where one feels timeless. No, time is pressing, loudly ticking, drilling. We are never cut off from the past and the future. We are fully aware of where we are going, how much time we have left, and how much time that has passed. Every minute spent is a lost opportunity, so we strive to be on top of time. We maximize time. And we are being left empty, but not in such a way that we are abandoned to ourselves or slip away from ourselves uh, in everything we do, but always um, or experience an emptiness as a whole. No, we are constantly inventing ourselves in everything we do, but always feel behind and unsatisfied. Unlike Heidegger's bored by and bored with, this form of boredom is more difficult to get hold of. Our digital preoccupation, this flow of stimuli and finger-clicking activity, ties together many of the professional and private situations we are in. They become an extended totality of repetition we do not know the beginning and the end to. It is an elusive monotony. Time is stretched out and because we are constantly stimulated, we don't have time to listen to boredom. We may not even realize that we are bored. And in that sense, boredom fatigue differs from Heidegger's profound boredom we are most likely not thrown back to ourselves. During the COVID-19 crisis and the remote teaching that took place, I would in hindsight say that boredom fatigue peaked for me. Being restricted to a 13-inch screen, communicating with a collection of stamps on Zoom or Teams, I noticed that I maximized time even more. I did multiple tasks at once, teaching, emailing, planning lessons, documenting. And since I had no classroom to move between, I remained seated, switching between different windows instead. When my colleagues and I discussed our working environment with our principal, we realized that all of us were trying to maximize time, feeling utterly behind and unsatisfied. I have painted a very gloomy picture here, and one could ask, is it always like this? Even during in real life lessons. Well, the remote teaching was an exceptional situation, but in a way I would say yes. Since we always bring our computer to class, and in a metaphorical sense, carry boredom fatigue with us. Um, in another way, I would say no. I'm often amazed at how everything else is put on hold when I'm in the classroom. When I close the door on the corridor to the corridor, I also close the door to what previously occupied my attention. And I close the door on a part of myself as well. My private sorrows, joys, boredoms, etc. are automatically pushed aside. My focus is on the pupils in front of me. I scale down to being Jenny the teacher, completely present in what I do. In the way I, if I reuse Maria's concept, hold and frame the classroom. Here I also meet the teacher I want to be, aware of the states the pupils are in, reflecting over the thoughts they communicate, and present, present in what takes shape in the room. So, to sum up and look ahead, studying boredom during the pandemic and distance education made me realize the existence of boredom fatigue and how it affects me. 
I felt ashamed. I don't want to be in this kind of consuming boredom. It feels morally wrong and it disrupts my quote-unquote empathic timing, as Maria was talking about. So I started to change my habits as a way of maybe getting closer to my proper self as a teacher. I have made myself less dependent on the computer. I write more often on the whiteboard and use fewer PowerPoints. I try to limit my emailing to morning and afternoon. I've removed notifications. I also try to stay in the more superficial forms of boredom. I try, for instance, not to open my computer when I'm bored during a meeting. Instead, I try to linger since boredom can, according to Heidegger, open us to possibilities we didn't know were possible. Thank you for listening. Well, let's come to the last point of this presentation. It's about isolation. And I want to, folk, uh, to relate this concept of isolation to educational research. Ah, sorry, educational practice. But as you heard during some of the talks before today, uh, in phenomenological research, there's a, quite a focus on sociality and collectivity right now, speaking of collective consciousness the possibility of a first-person perspective plural and the possibility of speaking of a we. And I've worked myself on this question for some time now, but I got more and more, I'm more and more interested in the idea of collectivity from, from other perspectives. For example, from the beginner, the one who is not yet part of a collective, but also from the perspective of the absent of others. So, uh, as Jenny and Maria told you before, the last years, uh, we sat at home and watching in our computer and it got more and more obscure to me to, to work on the possibility of group action and collectivity. So I was thinking about the situation of a situation of possibly isolation, not only for me, but in general as something that is experienced by people. But it's difficult to, to speak about this as a shared experience, since we related to this experience or this being asked to stay at home had, have been experienced by people on different ways, where some of us were isolated at home, others were uh, who, with small apartments or many siblings, or working in uh, uh, professions where it was really important to be at place as nurses, for example. They can't speak of isolation. They couldn't speak of isolation, quite the opposite. They maybe tried to find the space to get some space, hiding at the toilet, in the sleeping room, at the coffee machine. So can we speak about the pandemic as a shared experience? Maybe not, but we can speak about it as something, as the climate crisis also, that concerns us all. In my presentation, I don't want to dive, dive deeper in all this discussion and research that comes now and now more on the surface on the, about the consequences of the, for pupils and children on their well-being and, and possibility of learning in these years and what it, how it has influenced. So I don't want to speak about this. But I want to focus on a specific situation of, of a Zoom seminar and ask in which way it could be described in terms of isolation. And to what extent this example can say something about the vulnerability of pedagogical practice as such. The situation, as it was described by both Jenny and Maria, as sitting at home, staring at the screen, looking in other faces. The others are there, in front of me, but not quite here. I can see them sometimes even hear them, but I cannot reach over to them, touch them, smell them, as Maria spoke about. It is difficult to really understand what they express with their faces. What do they think? Who are they? And what are we talking about? 
The word of our conversations is somehow bleach, foggy. And if I get offended or bored, I can, in principle, just close my computer and pretend that my internet is unfortunately not working. As a teacher, I am on my own and at the same time engaged in the life of others, learners I have a responsibility for. We are distributed ac across the town, sometimes even the world, but somehow also here together around something, a text or a certain topic. Is there a we? Is there something we share? And what would that mean? My paper has three parts. One is about plurality, the concept of plurality, as Hannah Arendt is developing it in her emerging work, The Human Condition. In the second part, I will distinguish between three forms of isolation. One we could call isolation as separation in terms of impossible totalitarianism, isolation in the act of production, and isolation as a presupposition for thinking. And finally, I will make some consequences, some remarks, some remarks about the consequences uh, for pedagogical practice. In her major work, The Human Condition, Hannah Arendt famously defines the sphere of human action as opposed to other spheres, production and work, or work and labor, in terms of a disclosure of the agent under the condition of plurality. Human plurality, plurality, is the fact that we always already find ourselves amongst others. In the midst of others, it has, Arendt writes, the twofold character of equality and distinction. Oh. If men were not equal, they could never, I'm quoting her now, as you can see, if men were not equal, they could never understand each other. If men were not distinct, they would ne need neither speech not, nor action to make themselves understood. Signs and sounds to communicate immediate, identical needs and wants would be enough. Distinctness is not the same as otherness, which is the quality of a specific empirical uh, way of being in relation to another observable. What I'm working with, where I'm from, how I feel, from a, th how I feel? No. From a third person perspective. Distinctness characterizes the uniqueness of being that can only be revealed from a first person perspective and via speech and actions. While in labor, but also work, others are needed we need to put our forces together in form of teamwork or work towards a predefined goal, as in production. Action and speech are related to the presence of others, quote, whose company we may wish to join, end of quote. But action is never conditioned by them. In human action, the agent discloses herself as someone, as a unique who, this disclosure of the who is in contradiction to the question of what someone is, his quality, gifts, talents, and shortcomings, which he or she may display or hide. The who is implicit in everything someone says and does. In fact, who one is, that appears sometimes so clearly to others, can even be hidden to myself. But as Aaron points out, this putting out myself, my who-ness, it uh, includes a certain risk. I'm putting myself out there, and I do not, do not really know where it, how it uh, land, lands, how, it, how, it, uh, how you receive it. That's where Aaron also says you never can really be totally responsible for your actions and what you say. And if you look at this Zoom situation where you speak to this group of um, stamps, 
I mean, it's always scary, but it's a bit scary. It's, I mean, you give this teaching, you don't know how, how it, you don't know, you can't see the, ex the expression, the face, you don't really know what's, what, what, who I am for the other one, or what, what we're speaking about to the others. For Arendt, it is in the sphere of action, or the Greek term praxis, that the com common world can be established. She argues that even if we're already born into a world with other, she calls plurality an original factor, urfaktum. It is also something that is constantly on trial and fragile. It is only when we talk to each other or do things together, we can relate to each other's perspectives, reconstitute our common space, or do some, build something, or bring something new into the world. This capacity can be lost if we're forced into isolation, if we're held separate from each other or against each other, but also if we are, as Arendt calls it, subordinating ourselves to a group, to a certain view on things. Arendt calls this the uh, rectified gaze, the gleichgerichtete Blick. Quote, Totalitarianism, which seeks to organize the infinite diversity and difference of man as if all mankind were but a single individual, is possible only if each person can be reduced to an unchanging, identical unity of reactions, so that each such bundle of reactions can arbitrarily exchange for each other. Hannah Arendt's concept of plurality thus points to a fragile dimension of the we, for which we are responsible for the formation of our communities. The we in this special form of actualized plurality, as the Austrian philosopher Sophie Leudold has recently argued, is not just an additional mode of being an I, but the essential way of how our existence unfolds in the world. One can easily see how a Zoom seminar can be both a space for plurality, but also for distinctness, where we can meet people far, from far away in totally different cultural and social contexts without traveling or spreading a possibly deadly virus. But we can also see the frag fragility of plurality in this kind of meetings, where we're still held separately from each other, struggling with an expression of our distinctness as opposed to the otherness that imposes itself on us, creating a certain inertia, inertia or as Jenny formulated, a certain limbo. If we describe the being part together in plurality in terms of an interesse, a space between us where we negotiate about the world that concerns us, it is more difficult to see in what this inter consists of in this case. This inter that both connects and divides us, like a table in a physical meeting. I'm going now to this uh, second part about different forms of um, isolation. In the chapter, The Fragility of Human Affairs, Arendt states out saying that action, as distinguished from fabrication, is never possible in isolation. To be isolated, quote, is to be deprived of the capacity to act. Yet the most complicated and precise description of isolation is offered by Arendt in the last chapter of The Origins of Totalitarianism. Isolation and loneliness, Arendt posits it, is the defining condition of totalitarianism and the common ground of all terror. Isolation and solitude flank loneliness as the two related but distinct conditions. Aaron's example, slaves and the subject of modern totalitarian states are both isolated and lonely, but not alone. Isolation, she writes, quote, made the beginning of terror. It certainly is its most fertile ground. It always is its result. Yet, uh, there's another concept of isolation in a more positive way we can find in Arendt's work. And it's, a it's namely in the sphere of um, production. 
namely as a necess necessary life condition for every mastership, which consists in being alone with an idea, the mental image of the thing to be. For example, when we try to, to write a paper, a report, or produce a PowerPoint presentation. This mastership, unlike political forms of domination, is primary master of things and material and not people. The only companion that grows out of workmanship directly is in the need of the master for assistance or in his wish to educate others in his craft. But the distinction between her skills and the unskilled is temporarily, like the distinction between the adult and children, teacher and student. Let us look at the situation of the Zoom seminar as a space that can produce different forms of human activity and interaction. There is a possibility for action in terms of plurality, as I just said, but it might be also a space for production and domination. The Zoom meeting is an educational context. It's not a place where people meet a citizen who negotiate uh, the best for the state. But is it a non-political community where teachers try to rectify the gaze of the students? Or a place where craftsmen could show and exchange their product? Do you know this picture of Peter Thielberg? This, it's quite I understood that it's not only famous in Sweden. Okay. But here they, the future productive generation, the future Ericsson employees are sitting here and try to learn as much to become all VDs or engineers in the future um, technology sector that should guarantee the welfare of Sweden in the next years. In Greece, it, always, it's, it was always the duty for tyrants to dis discourage the people from worrying about public affairs and to transform the agora to a place of affairs, affairs where the, the, one, the individual can show the result of their productivity of things often produced in isolation from each other's. PowerPoint presentations, a summary of a book one has read, uh, a text to get the mark for, but also amusement. But instead, the Zoom meeting is boring. It somehow confronts us with ourselves. Now I'm going to this last uh, understanding of isolation in terms of thinking. Uh, I forgot this breakout room slide, maybe you will not be so sad about it. Um, in her essay, Thinking and Moral Consideration, Arendt is formulating a third form of isolation. I mean, she doesn't, I, I'm, I'm just putting these forms together from a different work, so it's not that she has this, um, yeah. Drawn, yeah, this list of, of forms. Besides the totalitarian and the productive of the marketplace, where we can show each other our products, namely the sphere of solitude that is necessary condition of thinking. Thinking needs a certain form of isolation, maybe so, or solitude. Yet, as Arendt argues, as a critique of Heidegger's way to understand, to understanding of it, of thinking as detached from the world, from the world, for her it is even though it is distinct from action and others intrinsically related to the world we share with others. In thinking, we start a dialogue with ourselves. This, should, this picture show, I'm not sure about it. You know, when you look for pictures for your PowerPoint presentation, you think it looks great. Then you see it two times four meter in the wall, you think, no, it's shit. But let's take it that way. Uh, it's a dialogue with oneself in thinking here, you see on the wall. Um, Yes, uh, in order to capture our action and thoughts that are withdrawing themselves in the performance of it, we have to withdraw ourselves from the world, like when we hide in the toilet, for example. In this sense, the isol or when we close our computer and just start thinking, the isolation that thinking needs is the opposite from the isolation that production needs, which leads to a product or of the rectification of the individuals to a mass. The isolation of thinking is not productive. It can be still destructive. The thinker has to tear down the house of her thoughts every time, says Arendt. Or she also uses uh, ideas like we have to, in thinking, we can defreeze our thoughts, our concepts. So we take the concepts we take for granted and then we have to defreeze them. 
Secondly, besides this defreezing, this const constructive way of thinking, thinking always deals with objects that are absent, removed from direct sense perception. An object of thought is always a representation that is something or somebody that is actually absent and present only to my mind by virtue of imagination. I can make it present in the form of an image. In order to think about someone, this person has to be absent. As long as he is here, I don't have to think of him. To think about someone who is present implies removing ourselves from his company and acting as though he were no longer there. Here the Zoom meeting is a somehow paradoxical. The other is absent. It would allow, but would allow for thinking, but still constantly present there uh, in this present of the stamps. I could dive into a discussion about something important, but I can also in principle in principle, knit a pullover, watch a Netflix program, or do my laundry while pretending listening to each other. To catch the difference between isolation that leads to importance and lack of action, and isolation that is necessary for thinking and might encourage action, I want to introduce the distinction between solitude and isolation. One can be together with others, but still feel isolated. Maybe this is the strongest feeling of loneliness. Do not reach to the other, even if the other is so cl close by me. In order to act in concert together, some distance is even needed. Think about the picture of the people at the Heldenplatz in Wien. I showed you, you know, the Heiling uh, mass. They're standing so close to each other, they cannot see each other in the eyes. They're directed the same direction a dissolvement of plurality, but also a lack of possibility of meeting oneself in reflection in the eyes of the other. Here the idea of a reality, a faculty to distinguish between fantasy and reality needs the perspective of the others as a presupposition for a constitution of a shared world. As objects have different sides, they have a front and a back side, and more. They have horizons, as we heard in the introduction lecture yesterday. We can go around it or ask someone else how the back set looks like. Here the Zoom room has a concrete problem. We do not share a physical room that allows us to go around things. There's only one side. Now to sum it up, some thoughts about the consequences or this what I said, this, that this may be a banal example of the Zoom seminar. You all fed up with these examples, I understand because we're so glad that we meet in person. But maybe it reveals something about this general pedagogical situation or the other social situation. Something, this vulnerability is always there. This unsecureness, putting ourselves at risk outside. Educational practice in its institutional form mostly takes place in groups where people gather around in a room, often at least from the outside. This group is divided in subgroups of those who teach and those who shall learn. From the inside, this is from the perspective of those who are involved in the ongoing interaction in class, this might look differently. Maria talked in her presentation of a relational dimension as a possibility to invite another subject to form a we that transcend or question the distinctions of groups. This can, we can occur between a middle-aged woman and a three-year-old girl with counting the numbers of coins he has at home or between a university teacher and an IT support struggling to connect a projector, projector with a laptop. In relation to the idea of groups or the concept of plurality as it developed with the help of Hannah Arendt, pedagogy in the form of an institutional practice is, as it is well known and discussed, an ambivalent endeavor. On the one hand, one can understand pedagogy as an agenda to introduce a newcomer into a world of meaning and at the same time to create shared spaces of meaning. Or as Arendt formulated, pedagogy is a pro pro practice of world sharing, developed mit anderen Teilen. Thus, pedagogical practice are not only meant to be an introduction for the newcomer, a question of participation or production of knowledge, but of mutual understanding, though it is built of an asymmetric relation. If we tie it to the topic of this talk, it is a part of an agenda to overcome isolation, to bind subjects together, or as Maria put it, to constitute a co-embodied space, a possible we. On the other hand, 
Pedagogical practice should contribute to this proce process of subjectification or deliberation, where a subject shall get help to become, well, yes, a subject that is find its such that it's that is find its own perspective and personhood, that what makes him or her just to him or herself, Gemeinigkeit, and enables her to question ideas of a group or a we, to stand out and speak for herself, and therefore presupposes thinking as a faculty that can be done in isolation or solitude. Thank you very much.